Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, is it? What's going on with libraries? Are you worried about the future or is the future bright? Are we being fed a bill of goods about the demise of the library or, you know, is it actually taking off and if it is, why? I know Absolutely. my question is all over the place there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. It's a question that any of the leaders in the library community are looking at closely. But honestly, the future is bright. We are needed more badly than we've ever been needed before. And our communities are saying that loud and clear. How? How, how are we needed more than ever before? The world is changing in a, uh, an ever greater and unpredictable way. Libraries represent one of the most consistent institutions that are able to support uh, our communities, our people, as they go through some of these changes, whether they're technological, whether they're labor changes and industry changes, whether they're societal changes due to uh, changes in your cultural living situation, whether you're a new immigrant or living in a community where you have a lot of new immigrants. There are many different aspects that libraries are, are working hard at to support their communities in evolving and changing and meeting the challenges of the new, the new future. So, I think most of us who would be my age and older think of libraries as being books. I go there to find some kind of written record about things. Uh, and the way you're smiling suggests, it's well, that's not even an accurate reflection in any way whatsoever of the modern day library. And that is absolutely the case, which is not to say we aren't about books. We've always been about books, and I suspect we always will be about books. Uh, but the modern library is not just about books. It's a core business for us, but it's only one of many. I would argue that the modern library is in the business of building communities. We've uh, changed very much from the traditional uh, idea of us being a, an, an archive or repository of a whole bunch of uh, dusty old books, which at one point in our history were very precious, very rare, now are quite common. Uh, books are only one, one source of information in this community, uh, in, in this country, in this world. There are many other uh, sources of information, many other different ways to interact with the, the written word, uh, obviously things like tablets and ebook readers and uh, any of the different technologies out there that, that make that possible. And there are many places for people to get those kind of sources. So it's not surprising to me that people look at libraries and say, wow, it's surprising that you're still around, uh, given that you know, you're about books and there's lots of books around and people have ways to getting them. The thing is, libraries have been engaged in many other activities than books for many, many years. I've been in libraries for 25 years, and in that time, uh, I've seen libraries evolve continuously to meet new, de new demands, to offer new services, to offer new uh, materials in their collections. In addition to books, we have DVDs. We, have, we had VHS tapes before that, now DVDs. We evolve through different formats as they come. We have e-books, we have e-audio books. We have any number of different other formats. There are libraries like Vancouver that have started looking at uh, loaning uh, musical instruments. Libraries that loan cake pans. Uh, cake pans. Cake pans, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so of course people don't always need to have a cake pan in their kitchen. They have a small kitchen. There are libraries out there that are experimenting with offering different unusual kitchen cooking implements so that people can stay. Okay, so let me ask you, when, when that happens, like you become like a lending resource. Yes. Uh, so if, if I go back and look at the history of libraries, I go, well, the average person goes, well, it doesn't make sense for me to spend the money on that book because I don't have the money. And uh, two, I don't have the space to hold it. And so therefore, you are a community resource that I can come to and I can borrow that book. By extension now, are we saying our living environments have changed? and uh, having a sewing machine may not fit into your 900 square foot uh, apartment. We at the library have that. How practical is it to be able to do that? Answer that first and then let's come back to the question of community because of that all, I think that all feeds into what makes a community and what makes a library so vital to the building of that community. And you said it yourself that our living conditions have changed. We are sitting in the middle of Vancouver. Vancouver has incredibly high real estate prices, which are getting higher every day. Uh, as a result, square footage of living space is decreasing significantly. So, to go back to the cake pan analogy, uh, an angel food cake pan, which you might use once a year, takes a lot of room. So maybe you could afford it, because of course you've got a fair amount of money if you're living in Vancouver. Then again, maybe not, if a lot of that money is going into your real estate investment. 
You might not have as much to just buy a cake pan you use once a year, but if you can go to the library and borrow it, then you both get it for the time you need it and return it and don't have to worry about storing it afterwards. So that's just one way that we do things, but there are many other resources that we offer for people as well. So uh, Vancouver Public Library here uh, has the Innovation Lab. So not everybody wants to have a recording studio in their home. They may want to record anything from some um, music that they're working on with a, a small local band, or for that matter, spoken word po poetry. There's many things people want to record to save for posterity, which leads to the role of the library as supporting the creation space or the maker space environment, where they help uh, people to explore their lives, to enrich their lives by creating, by building things, which is a new growth area for libraries that we support. They have a recording studio? They have a recording studio. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's open to people who have a library card. That's right. That's it. The price of admission is your library, library card. card. i got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So let's go, come back to this issue of how does that help us build community? How, what does the library do that allows us to have that sense of belonging to something larger than ourselves? And boy, that's a great question. We do a tremendous number of things for a tremendous number of different areas in the community. Right now we have, uh, of course, a, a large number of immigration um, uh, types coming in, so different people coming into the country. Uh, Syrian refugees, for example, were one of the more recent groups that came in. So we have a program that runs through the libraries called New to BC. New to BC is a settlement program that helps people become comfortable with a new country, to learn how to live here, to learn our culture, to learn our customs, and to start their own community locally here within the greater community of BC and Canada. Um, in addition, to make sure that people have some of the resources that they might have had at, in their home country, uh, which they might not have in their new country, we purchased a, at Fraser Valley Regional Library a large collection of Arabic materials so that the Syrian refugees coming in would have something to read in their native language. So did you already have those materials in stock or did you order them in to meet the need? We ordered them in to meet the need. We saw a need and we met it and they're very, very popular. But, so I have that, how does, how does uh, a new uh, resident in one of your communities even know that you have this and who do they talk to if they come into the library? Because we're, you know, the predominant culture is that is English speaking. Many of these people arrive here with limited English speaking skills. So we have marketing departments that ha that produce materials, marketing brochures and and posters and the like in many different languages. Uh, I think in the Fraser Valley Regional Library, it's roughly twelve or fourteen. Um, because we, we cover a large uh, catchment area. So we definitely market to a variety of different languages to encourage people to come in. One of the greater challenges we have, a lot of people coming in from other countries, especially refugees from a country where they might have a, a, a very different style of government, more of a dictatorial type of government, they don't trust the government. And of course, when they come here, they have um, the same learned distrust of some of those, uh, those cultural institutions. So they don't see the library as something which is trustworthy because it might be connected to the government, it might be a risk to them in that way, or it might cost money. And one of the bigger challenges we have is just teaching people who are new to the country, we're free, as in we're funded by taxpayer dollars, but we're available to you without cost to you directly, personally. Free. Where did that concept of being free come from, and why is it so important? It's another challenge in libraries. We are not free. There's no question about that. We are funded by taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. We provide a very, in, a very impressive return on investment uh, for those taxpayer dollars. But we are, uh, like any service, we do cost money. Um, the free component came out from some of the philanthropic uh, elements from well over 100 years ago when people were first contemplating what a new public library would look like. So of course, the Carnegie Corporation was one of the earlier areas that supported that. They wanted to have an information source that was available to all. Um, again, free, but not, you know, they recognized it but cost money. Free, but yeah. not free, that's <laughs> right. Uh, free to the borrower of the book, but not free to society as a whole. Exactly, yeah. because all of these services cost money. And that's one of the challenges, one of the reasons why libraries are being questioned, like many other uh, cultural services, is the question of whether or not they are worth what we have to pay for them as a society. Okay, how do we measure that? And, and what really is their worth to society? 
So there are at least a dozen different models that have looked at trying to get a return on investment for what the library costs in direct dollars. Mm -hmm. So for example, you buy one book at say $30. You have staff that sustain it, that introduce it to the collection, that actually loan it out to the person, receive it. All those different costs are on top of the $30 cost for the book. So mm -hmm. in the end, we might say the book costs $45. So if we have 15 people who borrow that book, it costs them each $3 to have access to the book. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we have got a $45 investment, which if all those 15 people were to buy that same book, would cost them each, say, $30 without the various costs on top of them. Uh, and then we have a, a cost that is in the ballpark of $450. So we can look at a return on investment based on that um, and decide that yes, the money invested in, the, in that book is returned many fold by the number of people who've used it who didn't have to buy the book. So that's the most so that's directly within within the library system, but you could also then say that that four hundred and fifty dollars is now available for other uses within the economy. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, there are many different models that look at trying to calculate what that return on investment is. Most have agreed that in general you can prove it's three to five dollars return to the economy for every one dollar you invest. And that does not include some of the ancillary benefits that are very hard to quantify, which are left out of those models. So for example, how do you quantify um, somebody who starts their new business based on research from the library and builds into a very successful business? How can you possibly quantify the percentage of success that that business has enjoyed based on the work that was done at the library at the very beginning. Things like that are very hard to measure and require long, uh, longitudinal studies. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. I just was watching a fascinating interview with Steve Jobs, and it seems like a, such a departure from this. But he was talking about how he and Steve Wozniak went to the library early on when they were in their teens doing all this research on different things, and that was one of the places that they went to, to gather enormous amounts of information. Well, Apple turned out to be a pretty successful company, I think, so you could go, well, there, there it is. But the difference is, back then, Steve Jobs didn't have access to the Internet, and I think people look at the Internet as being this enormous threat to the public library. What do I need it for when I've got the Internet of all things? <laughs> so a personal <laughs> anecdote which is very appropriate in this situation. In the late 90s, when I had worked, already worked in libraries for several years, working at the circulation desk, at the information desk, in a variety of different roles, I decided that I wanted to be a librarian. So I talked to the librarians who were around me, and I said, you know, I really like what you guys do. I'm very interested. I want to become a librarian. Where would you recommend I go to school? Their answer to me was, go and do computer science because Google is going to replace us all. So that's that what they were saying then. Essential back in the 90s, that's what they were saying then. So fast forward now, almost 20 years, Google hasn't replaced us. In fact, I would argue we've become more important than ever. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of tend to think of computers as being ubiquitous, um, but you're saying not so, but even still, for those who do have access to computers at home, how does the library then become relevant? Or is the internet motivating them to find other things? And this is the question. So often the internet serves as the initial step in a discovery journey. And we look at, in libraries we are doing what a lot of retail organizations are doing. We're looking at the customer journey. So where does the library fit into the customer's journey? As they explore a, a, a part of their, biz of their business or personal or professional life that they're interested in? Librarians and a lot of the library staff that work with librarians are professionally trained in how to assess information and determine whether or not the information is valid, whether it's supported by evidence and research, or whether it's an internet meme that just looks really great. Well, I think that that is an important point because there, there's many times that I'll go and I'll be looking up something and I know that I'm being inundated page after page of Google search with uh, you know sites that have been, you know, engineered to be there through search engine optimization and getting to those academic papers or the you know the the, the far more critical or non-biased uh, bits of information becomes challenging what role can the libraries help me uh, out in in trying to work my way through that the web of the web absolutely <laughs> so they talk about the deep web so a lot of what we have access to on the internet right now is a, an incredible mishmash of different facts, not all of which are facts, 
um, available to anybody for free. But there are better sources of information out there, so electronic databases, um, pay for paywall uh, information sources where you actually have to pay a monthly fee to get in. Mm -hmm. And in those areas are a lot of the best information, information on things like, for example, legal material. Legal material is one of those areas that information is actually surprisingly hard to find on the web, and yes. especially locally it's hard to find. So there you'll find something from a U.S. jurisdiction, but not from a Canadian jurisdiction. So because that information has a lot of value, it is not something which is readily available for free online. To get access to one of those legal sites, even if you're able to assess them correctly, is very challenging because they cost an awful lot of money and which one do you go for? Mm -hmm. So the library pays a uh, bulk license for various very rigorous uh, evidence-based research sources for everything from professional journals to uh, legal material to medical material, which are far more um, uh, reliable, far more fact-based. And than robust, and I robust. would imagine, yeah. <laughs> than a lot of the material that you'll find at the various free sources on the internet. And so I have access to that just by virtue of my library of card? Of your library card. And in most cases, uh -huh. um, in most cases, you can walk in off the street and simply access it through one of our public computers without even your library card. The library card gives you the ability to access it if you have a home computer from your home computer through the library's website. Really? Huh. Okay, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about where we are, uh, uh, in the current state of libraries in BC. And, you know, I also want to pay a little bit of tribute to Helen Gordon Stewart, who I think that without her, we wouldn't, wouldn't have be. the system that we have. Tell me a little bit about her, what she did, uh, how she helped us get to here, and then we'll sort of finish it off with where are we at and what does the future look like? Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Helen Gordon Stewart is uh, very near and dear to the heart of my library, Fraser Valley Regional Library. Without her you wouldn't exist, would you? Absolutely that. We yeah. are in fact, were the first regional library system in North America uh, and we were established by her working with the Carnegie Foundation and with all of the different um, uh, municipalities in the region. So at the time there were 24 different lo local government structures. Um, there were also countless clubs, associations that were connected to all of those government structures. So in the early days of Fraser Valley Regional Library, she drove around the valley building relationships, working with all of these different groups using a basic grant of $100,000 that came from the Carnegie Corporation. And with that grant, she was able to weld together 20 out of 24 of these different, uh, different groups to produce the very first regional library system. But it's not just Fra Fraser Valley Regional not Library that she was involved in. Like, without her, I'm not sure what the library uh, landscape would look like in British Columbia. She had experience at Victoria Public Library. She worked at Vancouver Island Regional Library, or the predecessors thereof. She was the driving force behind libraries in this province, and she was our first CEO. We have a lot to thank her for. We do. Who knew libraries were so fascinating? But uh, we're going to hang on for just a second for our last break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So what's the biggest challenge facing libraries going forward? If it's not the internet, then what, what is the challenge and what do we collectively need to do to ensure that <laughs> you can meet that challenge for our own good, like for our own selfish interests? Without question, the, the greatest challenge is the shrinking tax dollar, and that's the, the, the greatest challenge we have. We are in competition with an awful lot of other services who are all looking for to sustain their services, which they feel are important, uh, to ensure that we have the best possible services available for our, our, our customers, for our, our, our communities. <coughs> Pardon me. One of the biggest challenges that we have in that particular case is ensuring that we are efficient, that we are uh, working towards uh, what our customers want, uh, providing them with the services that they like, not things that we think they should like. Uh, we work very hard towards ensuring that we get that we give them the best value for their dollar possible at a time when we are competing with many other areas. And kids now start to move towards devices, as so many are. Uh, how do you keep them coming in the library, and how, and, and, or are you seeing an increase? Um, because I would imagine the next generation, the next generation, the next generation actually coming to the library 
is going to be fundamentally important to them. Critical. So mm -hmm. we have, we, we would regard in some ways our core demographic, our core customer demographics as being in two areas. Young families are obviously a key one, and that's one that we have to make sure we get because that's our future. Those are the people, when they start coming to the library, they keep coming usually throughout most of their lives. But the but other doesn't the internet get in the way and sort of herd a bunch of those people out? For sure, but here's the thing. Pew Research down in the States, which does a lot of the best research on libraries, did a study to look at who was using libraries. One of the largest groups using libraries were teens. And you teens. might think, teens. Why would teens be using the library? Because they all have their faces buried in devices. In days. devices. Yeah. In devices that are usually supported by a very cheap wireless plan with very limited um, uh, d uh, downloading capacity. But if they come to the library, we offer free Wi-Fi. So they can hook up their phone to the free Wi-Fi and they use that to access to, to access Facebook or whatever other services that they're using with their friends. And that's a way for them to expand their, um, their, their very limited phone plan, their cheap phone plan, to be able to do some of the things, participate in that larger digital community as part of the library. And oh, by the way, the, while they're at the library, they learn about all the great things that we can offer them. They have places to work on their homework. They have books that they can get, because again, bear in mind that they're on limited income, so a lot of them want to be able to read a book. Here's one of the best parts. If you look at, the, at, at the, uh, that same demographic, you would think that they would be the ones who'd be most interested in, in e-books. You know, read an e-book on their phone, right? That's what right. you would think, yeah. perception. So these are the study of teens to find out if that was indeed true, and it wasn't. It's not? It's not. They actually are one of the most dedicated groups reading regular books. Why? This is a culture that's grown up with Facebook, with having their life out in front of them. If they're reading a book on their, on their tablet or on their phone, there's no cover on that book. Nobody can see what they're reading. A lot of them said they wanted to be able to have a real book because when they're sitting there reading their real book, everybody else around them looks and sees what they're reading. And that was important to them because they want their life to be out there. That's the way that they build relationships. That's the way that they develop friendships. That's the way that they build their community. So you're pretty enthusiastic about the future of libraries, mm. I can tell. Massively enthusiastic. We have nothing but opportunities ahead of us. Uh, just another great example of the way that people use libraries that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Six or seven years ago, we started seeing a massive boom in January. So in January, we had, this is again, usually a very quiet time for libraries, but in January, we had a lot of senior citizens coming in. What were they doing? They come in with their latest tablet, smartphone, or other electronic device, and they'd say, <laughs> so I got this for Christmas for my grandkids. They tell me if I want to talk to them, I got to do it on Facebook. What is that? And how do I get it on this? <laughs> It's a, a huge area, and that's been consistent for years now. We see this massive increase in people in, in January who have no idea what to do with the Christmas present they just got. <laughs> so in other words, you are a trusted resource. Yes, we are. Well, I wish you all the success, and I uh, want to have continued success for libraries. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very this. much. Yeah. Appreciate it.